All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to USIP. Um, we have a bit of a full house, so I think there's still some people trickling in, but we wanted to make sure that we got started. So thank you for joining us this morning. Today we have five incredibly accomplished panelists who are going to give us a wide range of perspectives as they walk us through some of the complexities involved with disengaging from violent extremism and reintegrating into local communities. For those of you I don't know personally, my name is Leanne Erdberg and I direct USIP's program on violent extremism. I have the pleasure of overseeing our latest efforts to focus on violent extremist disengagement and reconciliation. Here at USIP, we also house the Resolve Network, which stands for Researching Solutions to Violent Extremism, which helps build the case for more rigorous, policy-informed research in order to improve efforts to address violent extremism. And at USIP, as a peace-building institute, we see that peace-building has a lot to offer violent extremism. Violent extremism is an expression of violent conflict, and as we have seen around the world, especially in the most fragile states, it is one it is only one of a host of violent outcomes that can result from a variety of different causes, including group marginalization, trauma, social grievances, and political grievances. Therefore, we see that peace building tools and approaches can transform attitudes and relationships and structures that not only fuel grievances, but also contribute to the dynamics that contribute to violent extremism. At USIP, we are deeply committed to empowering people and empowering institutions to build peace. We do this through events like this one, thank you for joining us, through published and empirical research, and through equipping frontline actors with the best possible knowledge out there, enabling them to impact their own communities. Disengagement from violent extremism is all about sustainability, and disengagement programs that fail to conceptualize this phenomena as a product of a lived experience in a particular environment are going to be unsustainable. We have a long history of spearheading cutting-edge research to champion evidence-based policy and effective and locally informed practice to build resilience to violent extremism and also sustainable peace. On this topic specifically, USIP has been involved in the so-called foreign terrorist fighters for several years. In 2017, we published our first special report on the topic called the Reintegration Imperative. And starting in 2018, we had the pleasure of partnering with the State Department and the Global Counterterrorism Forum to help develop internationally recognized good practices on addressing the challenge of returning families of foreign terrorist fighters, which was adopted in 2018 on the margins of the UN General Assembly. Recently, USIP has been engaging with five Central Asian countries on these issues, especially as Kazakhstan has become a leader in the repatriation of its citizens who have traveled or lived or fought with ISIS. We've also hosted a number of well-received events, which we hope this one contributes to that legacy, um, including ones on the effects of trauma, the effects of stigma, and and understanding specifically hearing from those who have disengaged from violent extremism. We also, our most recent special report on the topic is called Injecting Humanity, Community-Focused Responses for People Exiting Violent Extremism. Our efforts have tried to keep up with this increasingly dynamic and complicated challenge that are facing governments and facing communities around the world. They're all seized with trying to figure out what to do when people who participated in violent extremism and the conflicts associated with them return home. As we saw in Norway yesterday, this is a highly charged issue for governments and for citizens alike. With ISIS's territorial caliphate extinguished, more than 100 countries could face the task of not only having to reintegrate their citizens, perhaps tens of thousands in all, but also preparing their communities for a future with them living next door. The statistics remain staggering. Over 50,000 foreigners traveled from approximately 120 countries. Thousands of children have been born into the so-called caliphate, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Syrians are displaced. There are unknown numbers of fighters in prisons across Syria and Iraq, and in dozens of other countries. And outside of Syria and Iraq, there continue to be violent extremism-related conflicts raging in the Sahel, in the Lake Chad Basin, in the Horn of Africa, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere. <clears throat> 
complicating this terrorism picture is the rise of white ring ethno-nationalist terrorism after seeing an increase of over 320% since 2014. Clearly, we see a need to rethink strategies to prevent violent extremism and figure out how to successfully disengage people from violence. This is why, starting this year, USIP is embarking on a journey to unleash the role of peace building to help us do so. Violent extremism is a complex phenomena, and the dynamics that contribute to it are manifold. But at the end of the day, it's social. And any comprehensive approach to disengaging people from violent extremism must be equally social in nature. Conventional de-radicalization programs focus on the rehabilitation of individuals. We see that peace-building contribution to disengagement will engage more systemically with communities who are impacted by violent extremism and to foster the reconciliation and transform the dynamics between those disengaging and the communities themselves. Peace building sees the value of building relationships and social bonds and offers individuals a new identity that rejects violence and allows for a peaceful and prosperous future, one that is not solely defined by someone's past. As we work on this, I'm reminded often of the humanity of this, even in the face of violence. Over the weekend, I was reading an article on the famous longitudinal Harvard study of adult development which has provided a wealth of findings over the last 80 years. But one that struck me in conjunction with this event is that it found that embracing community helps us to live longer, be healthier, and be happier. This, of course, has obvious implications for our work on disengagement, but I also hope that it has implications for all of us here today. With that, I invite you to be part of our ongoing and continuing community on this topic. We hope you will join us on this journey, and we look forward to sharing our findings with you as we progress throughout the rest of the year. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome you here to USIP and to hand it over to Chris Bosley, a senior program officer on my team here in our program on violent extremism, who will lead us in this effort. Chris has been with USIP for nearly two years, following over a decade of service in the intelligence community in the US Navy. Chris is gonna to moderate today's discussion and introduce our very impressive speakers. Thank you, and over to Chris. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, thank you, panelists, for coming out. Thank you, all of you, for braving the cold and coming out and joining us here. Um, so we're all here, obviously, to hear from our wonderful panelists. But first, before I turn it over to them, I wanted to take about five minutes uh, just to kind of level set us all uh, with some context and to frame the conversation a little bit. So over the past couple of years, uh, we know that the world has really been seized with the challenge of returning foreign terrorist fighters. Leanne, you gave us some of the numbers we're talking about, and some of them really are pretty staggering. Um, now, I want to say at the top, I really hate the term foreign terrorist fighter. Uh, I feel like when it first became prominent in policy circles, it signaled a specific priority, a, a really counterterrorism priority. Uh, but today, I think after several years of watching this phenomenon, uh, every single word in that phrase could be wrong or false in any given case. Um, and it leads us nowhere when we're looking for solutions. More so, uh, I think re-socialization is really key to disengagement, and rehumanization is key for reconciliation. This requires not only working with the individuals to encourage help-seeking and pro-social behavior on their part, but also working with communities in order to open spaces for sustained, positive, and inclusive interaction between those returning and community members and institutions. Uh, and stigma is a real barrier to this. Uh, it's a real barrier to open in those spaces, and so I'm really going to try to avoid using stigmatizing language like foreign terrorist fighter. Now, of course, justice is a really, really important facet of the challenge, uh, and by no means am I trying to minimize the importance of, of that. Uh, let's not forget, ISIS is absolutely a genocidal organization. Uh, they deliberately targeted civilians. They've cleansed entire ethnicities. They enslave women. Um, but prosecution is not always going to be possible, and it's not always going to be appropriate. Children, for example, are victims. They were trafficked or born into conflict at no fault of their own. And many adults, particularly the women, are likely to be a really complex mixture of uh, perpetrator and victim that justice systems are going to have a hard time grappling with. Um, moreover, evidence from a foreign battlefield is often difficult to collect in ways that uphold evidentiary standards. 
Uh, and so in addition to prosecution, many people are going to be reintegrating directly back into the communities. And so for those people and for those communities, there's an imperative to manage the risk and to invest in real disengagement programs that work. Now, I'm going to say something a little bit provocative here. Um, we know how to disengage people from violent extremism. Uh, many conventional de-radicalization, so-called de-radicalization programs, conveniently focused on an individual's ideology and their beliefs. Uh, but unfortunately, this kind of round ca runs counter to much of the research that we have in several ways. One, it assumes that so-called radical beliefs precede violence, when in fact such a causality is not so clear. We know that not all people with radical beliefs become terrorists, and we know that not all terrorists hold radical beliefs. So not only is it very hard to convince someone to change their entire worldview, but there's little evidence that changing that worldview would actually lead to disengagement in any meaningful or sustained way. Rather than ideology, then, it's important for us to look at behavioral approaches to disengagement. Two, conventional programs ignore decades of sociology, psychology, and criminology literature on how people voluntarily exit roles, including violent ones and ideological ones. Yet, because violent extremism is both ideological and violent, it's treated as exceptional. Uh, but there are threads that run through all of this research uh, that among the most important facets of any disengagement program is forming social bonds and a sense of belonging outside of the violent extremist group. And then three, most people leave violent extremist groups not because of a sudden change of heart, but for more mundane reasons. Uh, disillusionment with leadership, burnout, or just moving on. So the lack of a viable alternative group into which is to assimilate really prevents disengagement uh, for those people. So this is a this is a two-way street. It's not only about rehumanizing rehumanizing society in the eyes of those who are disengaging. It's also about rehumanizing those who are disengaging in the eyes of society, which is why we're deliberately using the term reconciliation in our initiative on violent extremist disengagement and reconciliation. Uh, that's about enough for me. I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Laura Smith is a senior lecturer in social psychology from the University of Bath. Her focus is on the psychology underlying social movements, collective active action, and socialization. Dr. Mary Beth Altier is a clinical associate professor at NYU. She studied extensively the reasons why people engage in political violence and has conducted government federal research on terrorist disengagement, reengagement, and recidivism. Dr. Heidi Ellis is the director of the Refugee Trauma and Resilience Center at Boston Children's Hospital. Over the course of a decade, she's engaged the Somali refugee community here in the United States through community-based participatory research to understand trauma exposure, violence, and how the social contacts impact developmental trajectories. Dr. Ellis is also the co-developer of Trauma Systems Therapy, a treatment model for traumatized children that explicitly addresses the interaction of social environmental stressors with a child's capacity to regulate their emotions. Dr. Rebecca Wolf, who we have joining us remotely, is a lecturer at the University of Chicago. Many of you may be familiar with Rebecca from her work uh, with Mercy Corps. She has a background both in practice and in academia, uh, researching and designing programs on political violence, conflict, and extremism worldwide. And then finally, Dr. Stephen Wine is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He has several decades conducting research with refugees and migrants in the United States and in post-conflict countries focused on mental health, health, and violence prevention. Recently, he's been heavily engaged in addressing Central Asian programs uh, to rehabilitate and reintegrate people returning after having traveled to fight or live with ISIS. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Laura Smith. Uh, Laura, violent extremism is the result of a complex interaction among cognitive, social, and structural dynamics. Uh, but this engagement needs to unwind that process while also addressing the experiences uh, of a person during the period of radicalization. This requires understanding, of course, some of the dynamics that are involved with the violent radicalization process. And Laura will help us to understand that process a little bit. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so, yeah, I'm a social psychologist, so I specialise in the processes by which people become attached to particular groups and those processes that predict why group members decide to take 
violent versus non-violent forms of action. So I'm going to talk about those processes today. I think I need to grab that. Okay. So first of all, um, some caveats. Today I'm going to talk about the processes um, that are voluntary, so why people willingly join extremist groups. So I'm not talking about those people who have been coerced or um, join against their will or for socioeconomic reasons. I see extremism as a form of collective action. And collective action is known in psychology as a group-based behaviour. So uh, people will engage in that behaviour because they are a member of a group, and that might be a psychological membership of a group rather than an official membership. So they can be psychologically attached to a group but not actually physically present with other group members. So if somebody engages in collective action that is a violent extremist action, we need to first ask why somebody is willing to join a violent extremist group and the processes by which they become attached to that group. I'm going to start with an example. So you may be familiar with this example. In uh, at the end of November 2019, Usman Khan was attending an event in London and he stabbed to death two members of the um, two people who were also attending that event. He was then pursued by members of the public out onto London Bridge. Um, the members of the public took him down. He was then shot and killed by police. And it transpired that he was wearing a fake suicide vest. Now, the reason I'm raising this example today is that he had apparently successfully completed two de-radicalization programs. The first, while he was in prison, he was in prison for a terror-related offense. And then he also completed another de-radicalization program after he left prison. And so um, in the media, people were asking questions like, why was he still, why does he still go on to commit this terror act of terror, despite the fact that he'd been through these de-radicalization programs? Why don't these programs work? And why haven't they been properly assessed? Well, I'd like to put it to you that many policies on de-radicalization focus entirely on the individual. So we know from research that there's a litany of reasons why a particular individual might be more open to uh, radical ideologies. Um, there's a whole list in, um, in UK policy of risk factors or push factors that explain why somebody is open to violent extremism. So this might include perceptions of marginalisation, social, um, social isolation, mental health problems, family breakdown, the list goes on and on. And most de-radicalisation programmes try to address those individual level push factors to make an individual more resilient to violent extremism. However, if we are to understand engaging with violent extremist groups as a group process, then these programs need to address the group process's underlying attachment to those violent extremist groups. And existing de-radicalization programs, at least in the UK, don't address those group socialization processes. So these individual risk factors are important, but they're relatively distal to the motivation to engage in violent extremism. And the more proximal processes are the ones that connect those individuals to violent extremist groups. So if somebody wants to engage in collective action or violent extremist action, they do so willingly because they believe that there's something wrong with the world and they seek a social or political change. And so these individual level risk factors might make somebody more open to seeking other like-minded others, to seeking interactions with other people who share those views. And that is the start of the socialization processes that connect individuals to violent extremist groups. So the first stage of socialization occurs when somebody with this perception that there is something wrong with the world that they want to fix, they want to change, uh, that grievance reaches out, subject to their necessary freedoms and opportunities, reaches out to like-minded others. And social interaction may involve face-to-face -face interaction with people who share their views, or it might be online via social media, or social interaction can be vicarious through finding websites, finding things that other people have written about their grievances. So they may be consuming communications written by others that, that align with their own views. Now that element of interaction is really, really important because we know that psychologically, once you interact with other people who share your views, it actually changes your psychology. So in particular, it's important that 
once you find like-minded others and once those people validate your grievances, once people agree with you on a particular issue, you can develop what we call a shared social identity. You become a group that shares a, shares a perception of what's wrong with the world and how to fix it. So then we see that the predictors of that person's behaviour aren't necessarily individual level risk factors, but their identification, their affiliation with a group of others who share their views. So interactions can lead to the development of this group affiliation or sense of identification, which is an emotional attachment to a group and internalisation of that group into their sense of identity. And this means that um, the group becomes a self-defining part of who a person is. It's an authentic identity. So we need to recognise that violent extremist group membership is an authentic part of an individual, that it's not pathological, but is, is actually self-defining. So then the question becomes, why do groups decide that violent courses of action are the most appropriate in their perception? Well, we know that the way that people perceive their treatment by others is really important. So if groups talk about their grievances and talk about the fact that they've been treated um, as they perceive to be illegitimate by authorities or states, if they perceive that their sacred values or ideologies have been violated, the human rights have been violated, or if they perceive that there's no other action that's going to be politically efficacious, then violent action, violent norms might be the ones that those group members decide upon. So it's that understanding of the societal context and people's perceptions of the societal context that's going to transform their individual level grievances through interactions with like-minded others into concrete norms for action. So we have to recognise that grievances can become collectivised through this process of engaging with like-minded others, so that individuals no longer perceive their own, um, for example, um, experiences of discrimination as something that's happened to them personally, but that's ha happened to them systematically as group members. So with regards to returnees, we need to understand how they um, perceive the context that they're returning to and whether they're going to experience the same kind of perceptions of the context like discrimination, like the violation of their values that radicalise them in the first place to join extremist groups. In some cases, um, things like uh, discrimination or um, actions by other groups have actually got worse, have polarised over the last few years, so they may be returning to a more extreme version of the context that radicalised them in the first place. So adopting a socialisation approach means recognising that radicalised individuals may be physically isolated but they're not psychologically isolated and they share a psychological connection with others who share their understandings of their social world. So when people return, uh, I advocate that we should acknowledge and recognise and respect people's social identities and group memberships as authentic rather than pathologising them and treating them as some mental health problem that needs to be fixed. And that when they return, they should be able to engage with alternative voices of leadership within their own communities. So that is communicating with people who share their broad worldview, but advocate different courses of nonviolent actions to address their grievances. And so the focus of contention in their communications and engagements in their communities should be on the legitimacy and vi viability of nonviolent responses to grievance. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I think it's, it's really interesting to talk about and to think about violent radicalization as a collective action process. Um, and, and I think to look at it as a, as a question of, of socialization and, and structure as well uh, really helps to highlight why peace building, which focuses on structural and social issues, uh, really has a lot to offer um, to this. Mary Beth, so if violent radicalization is an inherently social process, can you talk to us a little bit about what we know about the disengagement process? Yes, of course. Can I grab the, the clicker? <laughs> All right, so thank you uh, to Chris and Leanne and USIP uh, for having me here today, and thanks to you all for coming out. Um, so as Chris mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the disengagement process and how that is inherently social, and I echo everything that, that Laura said, um, that our programs are really targeted towards the individual, and that they do need to focus on reintegration into this, this broader context. 
All right, so I just wanted to start with a quotation. So this is a former nationalist terrorist that I interviewed, um, and he said, when I was arrested, when the police were trying to interrogate me, they didn't realize that there was this Niagara Falls of relief, and my mind went into this cool zone of intense relief. Because as I was sitting there, my mind was thinking, my God, I've survived, I've been captured. I never expected to. People often don't realize that the terrorists they've captured may have been looking for a way out. And this individual was deeply committed to the ideology for all the social re reasons um, and grievances about the government, et cetera, uh, that Laura mentioned. But he really was deeply disillusioned with his involvement in terrorism and violence. Um, and he wanted to give up that involvement in violence, but he just couldn't see a way out for himself. He didn't see a way of reintegrating into society. Um, and another thing that he mentioned to me was that if there had been some NGO he could have gone to, and he said he would have served time, et cetera, that, that was, there was no problem, but he just didn't see a pathway out of the organization. And he was in this group for, for three years just looking for a way out. So I think we need to also recognize that not everyone who is involved in terrorism, while they may be, some of them may be committed to the ideology, many of them actually are trying to find a way out of involvement once they're there. All right, so what does it mean to disengage? I could talk about this for, for a long time, but I just want to uh, point out here that it is a dynamic process. We shouldn't think about disengagement as a static event. It's not something that just happens at one you know, sort of point in time. If we you know, um, look at literature on criminal desistance, this is best theorized as a dynamic, ongoing process. In criminology, they look at de uh, a decline in offending over time, for instance. All right, so what explains disengagement? So when I began studying this back in 2011, and this is where the literature was at. It had basically, through interviews with small samples of terrorists, had identified different push-pull factors that explain people's uh, reasons for disengaging. So these are different reasons why individuals said they, they disengaged from terrorism. I think it's important to point out, I think most people in the audience would know, but just when we're talking about disengagement from terrorism, we're talking about giving up the behaviors, right? giving up those behavioral involvements in terrorism. When we speak of de-radicalization, we're talking about giving up those beliefs um, that motivate terrorist behavior. Um, so in terms of push factors, push, push factors are things about your involvement in terrorism that push you away, right? So things like um, a lot of things Chris had, had alluded to earlier. So disillusionment with the strategy or actions of the group, having trouble living underground, a clandestine lifestyle, burnout, often just not getting along with members, um, disillusionment with your role. So you go to fight for ISIS and you want to be a jihadi on the front lines, but no, you have to peel potatoes and, and clean toilets, right? So that, so that can make you deeply disillusioned. Pool factors, on the other hand, are things things about your involved or things outside your involvement in terrorism that might lure you away. So the desire to marry, the demands of having children, um, having positive interactions with moderates, amnesty, financial incentives. So this framework I found a little bit, you know, it's, it's useful, it's a useful sort of heuristic, but I found it unsatisfying for a couple of reasons when I began studying this. One is that many individuals experience these push-pull factors and don't ever disengage. Um, it also doesn't explain why some people experience these push-pull factors at one point in time and don't disengage, and then later on in life maybe experience it again and do disengage. Uh, it also doesn't explain how they interact to affect disengagement decisions. So what I did is I turned to um, the broader literature that I thought could help inform our understanding of terrorist disengagement. As Chris mentioned, right, this isn't a new phenomenon. People leave all kinds of things, right? We, we quit our jobs, we leave our boyfriends, we leave our girlfriends. Um, so, so it's not a, a completely new phenomenon. So I looked at the literature on criminal desistance, on disaffiliation from new relig religious movements or cults, on voluntary role exit from sociology, so why people leave, um, for instance, the clergy, um, on commitment from social psychology, and then on workplace turnover, so why someone might quit working at USIP and go work, I don't know, for the Pentagon or something like that. Um, so but it's, it's, it's true, right? No one, no one would ever quit working at USIP. Deeply satisfied, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, there were a lot of frameworks from these literatures that I found really useful, but they're just two that I want to highlight today. Um, so the first is what's called Rust Belt's investment model. So this is Carol Rust Belt's investment model, and there are social psychologists on the stage who are probably more well-versed in this than I. Um, but, but she posits that one's commitment to a social role or to an organization is a function of three things. One is the satisfaction that they get from involvement. And that satisfaction can come from different things, right? It might be financial gain, it might be the social bonds you get, it might be because you're deeply committed to the ideology and you love that you're you know, engaging in violence on behalf of that ideology. But it's also a function of the investments that you make in the group, right? So I tell my students, like, if you get a swastika 
tattooed on your face, that is a, a big sunk cost, right? That's a big investment you make in your involvement. Um, and that affects your, your last thing, which are the alternatives that you have outside the group, okay? And so someone's commitment at any point in time is a function of these things, and these push-pull factors affect, um, affect those different components. And, and just to highlight what we're talking about here today, alternatives are a very important part of that equation. So you can be deeply, deeply dissatisfied with your involvement. And I've seen this time and time again in interviews uh, with former extremists, but you just can't actually see a way out, right? You can't see those alternatives. They're, they're just so low that you just remain in the group. Uh, the other framework that I found useful um, comes from industrial and organizational psychology, and they posit three different types of commitment. And I think this is useful when looking at individual terrorists or thinking across groups how these different types of com uh, commitment might vary in terms of the, the, mem the membership of the terrorist group. Um, so the first is effective commitment, and that is an emotional attachment to your involvement. So you're there because you want to be there. You get warm, fuzzy feelings. You're deeply satisfied. You're usually, and if we're talking about the terrorism context, you would probably be ideologically committed to the group. The second is continuance commitment, and people with high continuance commitments have few alternatives um, and have high sunk costs, right? And so they're there for a different reason. They may be deeply dissatisfied, but they just can't see a way out. So they have what we call high continuance commitment. And the third, which I think is really important and speaks to some of the things Laura was mentioning, is normative commitment. And that's why I put this framework on here. Um, normative commitment is that you are involved because you have a sense of duty. You feel you've been socialized in a way that you feel it is your duty to fight for this cause or to believe in this cause. And so when we think about reintegration and disengagement, I think it's important to think about the communities that we're reintegrating individuals into and what the norms are and do people feel that they have a normative commitment. And in some cases, they may have very legitimate grievances that underlie their involvement. All right, so in terms of looking at why they leave and some empirical evidence, I'm gonna put a lot of data up, but I won't go through it, I promise, but just to show you that I did do my due, due diligence. Um, so what we did is we looked at, um, and this is research I did with Dr. Emma Leonard Boyle and Dr. John Horgan. Um, so we looked at a sample of 185 engagement events, and these were drawn from terrorist autobiographies, um, and they cover over 70 terrorist groups. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, a series of in-person interviews. Um, and so one of the key findings we found is that these push factors, as Chris mentioned, are really, really important in driving disengagement decisions. Push factors much more commonly explain people's reasons to disengage than the pull factors. So not to say that the pull factors are important, I know that's why we're here, but, and I'll get to that in a minute. But in explaining why individuals actually leave a terrorist group, most commonly it is these push, uh, push factors. And the other interesting thing we found was that in only 16% of cases did the individual cite a loss of faith in the ideology as a reason for leaving. So most people disengage without ever actually de-radicalizing at the point of their, their exiting um, terrorism. In terms of the pool factors, you can see here they occur less frequently, but the interesting thing we found is that for the non-ideologically committed, they actually were cited as playing a role. So when we break our sample down and we look at individuals whose involvement wasn't motivated um, by ideological commitment, what we found is that these pool factors were really important. So having positive interactions with moderates, having educational opportunities. Um, uh, so for individuals who maybe their involvement was motivated by social bonds or financial gain, these pool factors really did matter for that small subset. Here are logistic regressions. So again, we did our due diligence there. Um, the other interesting thing, we have a paper coming out um, soon, uh, and this paper shows that the other thing that we found is that leaders and those, those in leadership roles and violent operational roles um, have a harder time leaving. And the reason that we found when we broke the data down is because they do perceive fewer, fewer alternatives for them themselves in society. Okay, so we look, go back to Rust Bolt's equation. It's really about a lack of alternatives um, because they do have higher sunk costs and fewer alternatives. So when we're looking at individual terrorists, um, one of the things I think is important to note is that these individuals who are in these leadership or violent operational roles do perceive that they will have a harder time reintegrating or that there's some alternative lifestyle for them. All right, so I'm going to switch gears now um, and talk about why individuals go back. So why they might, once they're disengaged, why they might re-engage. Um, there are a number of de definitional measurement issues with re measuring re-engagement. So you've probably all seen 
uh, recidivism statistics from programs. There are a number of issues with those. One is that we don't have an adequate time horizon, right? So um, just because you're de-radicalization program has a low recidivism rate now, you know, Usman Khan, for instance, hasn't gone back to terrorism, doesn't mean that tomorrow he won't attack London Bridge. Um, so one of the ways that we circumvented this is we, we turn to these autobiographies because they do give us an individual's whole life course, and they also give us what, what are called self-report data on re-engagement. So does the individual say that they went back to terrorism? Um, and these are this is really useful. This is what criminologists say is sort of the gold standard, is knowing if you have some self-report data on whether an individual went back. Um, it is important before I, I don't know if I can go back or not, uh, but it is important to highlight that the individuals in our sample were not subject to the surveillance that we have in place today. They weren't subject to very lengthy prison sentences. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through these re-engagement rates and they're much higher than what we see for um, current programs uh, in place today. And part of that is because we don't have the time horizon and part of it is because individuals are serving longer prison sentences and part of it is because they are subject to very strict surveillance measures. Uh, but in cases where individuals voluntarily disengage from terrorism, they just chose to walk away, we have in our sample a 58% re-engagement rate, that is they went back to terrorism. Uh, in cases where individuals came out of prison, we have a 68% re-engagement rate. Uh, in cases where a group, an individual's disengagement was part of the group voluntarily moving into politics or something like that, we have about a 35% re-engagement rate. And then in the case of involuntary collective where a group basically is defeated, so you can think about ISIS, uh, we have a 67% re-engagement rate. All right, in terms of the risk factors, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, the risk factors, what we did is we looked at risk factors, again, drawing on the criminology literature. Um, so I said, you know, look, let's start with what they look at when they look at criminal recidivism. Um, and in criminology, in terms of looking at risk factors for re-engagement or recidivism, uh, the most prominent is age, right? So we think that offending or re-offending declines with age. Um, uh, others are history of deviant family members or friends, uh, an individual social class of origin. Uh, having antisocial attitudes or values, and then also having antisocial associates. Okay, so in the terrorism context, this is remaining committed to the ideology or, you know, retaining ties with individuals involved in terrorism. Uh, and then a really important risk factor for recidivism in the criminal context is pro-social bonds. Um, so if individuals, the criminology literature shows quite clearly, Samson and Lobb have a very nice review of this, um, but it shows quite clearly that if individuals through marriage, through employment, through educational opportunities, if they can establish pro, what we call pro-social bonds with individuals who aren't engaging in criminal activity, they are much less likely to return uh, to crime and to reoffend. So we tested all of these with our sample. Um, and the first thing we found is that the uh, relationship with age holds. So in our sample, the likelihood of re-engagement in terrorism or recidivism being caught uh, in, a, in a terrorist offense uh, declines with age. You can see it peaks about 28, 30, and then declines over time, except there's one old guy there. You can see at the end, who <laughs> goes back. Um, and then with regard to the risk factors, just to highlight that the two most common risk factors we found are the most important that had the, lar you know, had the largest effect on increasing the probability of, of recidivating um, were uh, retaining ties to the ideology uh, and retaining ties to individuals still involved in terrorism. So if in it, so, while we found de-radicalization wasn't important in causing disengagement, we found it was a critical risk factor for re-engagement. So if you retain those ties, you are much, much more likely to go back. Um, and if you retained your belief in the ideology. We also found that those who came from a lower childhood socioeconomic background were much more likely to return statistically significant effects there. And I think that has to do with the lack of alternatives. They don't necessarily have the same educational background, the same networks, and so they have a harder time um, reintegrating. Importantly, we found that those pro-social bonds effects that are so strong in criminology don't actually increase the risk of re-engagement in the short term. Uh, I'm not going to say why they matter in a minute. <laughs> so in the short term, they don't actually increase the risk of re-engagement, but I think they're actually fundamentally important. So I actually struggle when presenting this data because I think if we want to change, going back to what Laura said, if we want to change attitudes and we want to change connections, in the long term, they're fundamental, right? If you want to challenge people's ideas and beliefs, right, having a pro-social spouse or having, you know, an, a job where you interact with pro-social people um, is really, really critical 
um, to that process. And I've seen time again with de-radicalization programs, if you have a government telling you to give up your ideology, right, or, you know, some law enf enforcement professional, right, you're just going to dig in. And so I do think that they're fundamentally important in the long term. Short term, they're not going to reduce the risk. If you have a radical person, give him a job. It doesn't mean tomorrow he's going to change, right? But down the line, over time, you know, I think it's fundamental. All right, and so I just wanted to close with this quote, and I think it really highlights that de-radicalization, disengagement, and de-radicalization are really long-term process, and changing those ideas and beliefs really does require this, you know, focus on pro-social attitudes, pro-social reintegration. Um, so this is a former Islamist extremist I interviewed over in, in London, um, and she says, the process is now you've come out, you're still carrying the narratives, where do you get that tackled, where do you find the alternative, it's probably taking me 10 years. And so she actually did enroll in an empl employment courses, she went online actually and read the Quran and challenged her own beliefs, but it's taken her so, you know, so long to actually give up those beliefs, and again, I, I do believe that that's an inherently social process. So that's all, so thank you. Thanks, Mary Beth. Really, that's fascinating. You know, I, I was looking at some of the, uh, the the dates on your citations, and you had 1994, 1998, 1980 something. I mean, this is all research that we've had for decades and decades and decades, showing us that you know having a viable alternative social group or, or having pro social bonds is really, really important. And you know, who are we to think that disengaging from violent extremism is going to be that much different from disassociating from these other roles? Um, now, of course, there are a number of barriers that could prevent pro-social engagement with uh, an alternative social group, uh, some of which are con cognitive and individual in nature, including trauma. Um, so Heidi, can you talk to us a little bit about trauma as a contributing dynamic to the violent radicalization and as a barrier to help-seeking behavior or disengagement? Yeah, and thank you, Chris, Leanne, um, for the opportunity to be here. And thank you to all of you for sharing your time this morning. Um, and to my fellow panelists for, I think, providing some really thoughtful looks into how complicated this is. Um, from what we've already heard, I think it's actually, do I need to move through? My whole thing. Oh. We'll get <laughs> there. A lot. That's all more than I know how to talk about. Okay. Uh, so from what we've already heard, I think it's clear that people who spent time under ISIS in Iraq and Syria will need to overcome a number of challenges in the process of reintegration, one of which is the horrific trauma that they are likely to have endured during their time there, and for some of them also perhaps in their countries prior to departure. When we talk about tra the trauma that kids living in ISIS-controlled territories endured, we are talking about a multi-layered, severe, pervasive presence of trauma. Save the Children conducted a study of kids who had lived in Al Hol and had spent time in ISIS-controlled territories. And here's some of what they found. Uh, these kids were witness to daily acts of severe violence, including killings. They commonly saw dead bodies in the street, there were bombs falling on their homes, they experienced extreme deprivation, the loss of loved ones, sometimes this involved witnessing the death of their parents, um, and really were part of a community that experienced a collective trauma, which means that their caregivers, the people who are most responsible for keeping them safe, were also dealing with the fallout from their own trauma. So unquestionably, uh, we need to grapple with this question. What does this mean for successful reintegration and rehabilitation programming? To answer this question, I want to start with the basic neuroscience behind trauma, then briefly pre present some of my own research on trauma and radicalization, and then finally take a step back to think about how, how all of this relates to successful reintegration and rehabilitation programming. While I'll be talking specifically about issues related to reintegration of children, much of what I say will also be relevant for returning men or women as well. Okay, so for the, for the brain science, our brains are exquisitely designed to promote survival in the face of threat. That's why we're all still here. Um, the amygdala is the part of the brain that is responsible for helping us to respond to threat, and it does so by activating our survival systems, and that typically typically looks like fight, flight, um, or freezing. 
So this is incredibly adaptive when we are faced with real danger. But when a child lives in an environment of chronic or severe threat, the amygdala can become potentiated, meaning that it begins to respond as if it is facing a true threat, even in settings that are relatively safe. What this means is that you can take a child out of an unsafe setting, like Al Hole, and reintegrate them to a much safer context, but their brains may continue to respond to minor stressors in the environment as if their survival is at stake. Trauma can manifest in a wide range of ways, impacting someone's emotions, their behavior, and how they even perceive and process themselves and the world around them. Over time, you can get what are called developmental cascades. If trauma is left untreated, then disrupted functioning in any one area begins to affect the normal developmental trajectories in another area. So you can end up with a cascade of disruptions across multiple domains. So I'm gonna uh, walk you through one hypothetical cascade um, so you might start, for instance, with a traumatized child who experiences intense fear, hypervigilance, and nightmares. That might look more like what we call PTSD. Um, but over time, that means when they go to school, they have trouble paying attention, their learning becomes disrupted, they start socially withdrawing from others around them. Once that takes root, they experience loneliness lagging social skills because they don't have the opportunity to practice them, um, poor self-esteem, they start struggling with school failure. This continues on in a developmental cascade potentially where there's family conflict. Parents are angry that the child is failing at school. The child might experience depression. Um, they drop out of school. And where does this leave them? Incredibly vulnerable to antisocial outcomes. So I put this up here not to forecast that this is what these kids are headed for, but to make two points. One, what starts as a trauma response in the brain can have long-term multifaceted consequences if kids don't get the support and treatment they need. So two, we need to be in the game of prevention. We need to be doing everything we can to get in early and turn the ship around so that instead of a cascade of problems, we can see a cascade of positive growth. So how do you do that? Um, the best answer to this question that I know has come from decades of work in child development and is based on the idea that a child is part of a social ecology. Whatever strengths or problems they have interact with the layers of the social ecology around them for better or for worse. They live in families, go to school, are part of communities and neighborhoods that, and at the broadest, broadest level, they're part of a nation. Disruptions in any one layer of the social ecology can have profound effects on the developing child at its core. So think for a minute about the kinds of stressors that kids may be facing in the process of reintegration. You might see cultural conflict, stigma, um, bullying at school, uh, as I mentioned, family conflict, but also loss and separation from their parents. Um, there's all the adjustment of coming into a new setting, the new culture. So for some kids, it's also a linguistic adjustment. Adjustment They may not um, speak the language of their home or country of origin. Um, and then individually, they may be bringing developmental delays, lagging skills, and mental health problems. But if these disruptions to the social environment can negatively affect development, the inverse is also true. Each layer of the social ecology offers an opportunity to create positive growth for the child. So let me illustrate how this works by drawing from some of my research with Somali refugee young adults. 18 years ago, I started working with Somali refugees in the United States, running a community-based participatory research program to understand what promoted positive developmental trajectories among youth who had experienced significant trauma and disruption. So a population that has some overlap with who we're talking about. When midway into my research, a number of Somalis left the US to join Al-Shabaab and later ISIS, I realized that our research team needed to also understand why some youth were vulnerable to extremist ideas when the vast majority were not. One of the first things we looked at was trauma. Uh, 
and in fact, we found that having experienced more trauma was associated with greater support for the use of violence for political change. But, and I want you to think of that picture of the social ecology here, this was only true for those who felt stigmatized in their communities or who felt disconnected from the United States in which they were living. And so what you can see here is the, um, the bottom lines that essentially are flat or you know, much lower are those who felt connected and like they belonged in, in the society in which they were living. And for those, greater trauma did not necessarily um, mean increases in radicalism. Okay, fast forward a few years to a much larger longitudinal study of Somalis in the US and Canada. This was a sample size of roughly 460. Um, and again, we found that trauma was associated with more support for violent radicalism, but other experiences in the social environment, like experiencing your government as just, or feeling a positive attachment to the US or Canada were protective. So within our study sample, we found that the way trauma played out in relation to one very specific outcome, views on violent extremism, was shaped by those levers at the outer level of the social ecology, at the level of government and community. In the Intervention Trauma Systems Therapy, we like to talk about how when you think about trauma using a socio-ecological lens, it multiplies your intervention opportunities because we can work not only from the inside out, providing really good mental health care for the child, um, but also from the outside in by thinking about how to build positive experiences throughout the social environment. As we think about building successful reintegration and rehabilitation programs for children who have experienced the kind of trauma that we were talking about earlier under ISIS, we need to be doing two things. We need to be thinking about the kinds of stressors they might encounter in the social environment and systematically working to reduce them. And then we need to be thinking about the ways that we can build safety, acceptance, and cohesion across the social ecology. So you might see, you might see um, efforts to address stigma and increase cohesion, thinking about due process and how you build that trust in government, that sense of a just government, opportunities for civic engagement, um, support for families and addressing family conflict in the school setting, thinking about bullying support um, and promoting academic success. And then at the individual level, mental health care and developmental support. So all of these layers for a child who's experienced trauma are going to be incredibly important because they may in fact shape a different trajectory as that child is recovering from their trauma. Um, and their sense, the child's sense of safety will interact with the social ecology um, to the degree that it, um, they feel threatened by it. So clearly for a problem like this, there's no silver bullet. Um, but just as unattended trauma can lead to negative developmental cascades, I believe that a thoughtfully orchestrated program um, that addresses both the trauma and the social environment can lead to positive cascades, where you might see a child who's experiencing a sense of safety and connection begin to be able to explore, trying new things at school, learning, making new friends, which then sets them on a path towards a long-term sense of belonging, um, positive sense of self, the world, and their future. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Um, I think it was really interesting. You drew some important connections between community rejection and trauma and trauma and violent radicalization. But really, what struck me um, was how something that a lay person would look at as individual and cognitive, like trauma, really is deeply social and even structural in nature. Now, violent extremism is not the only highly stigmatized and complex social phenomenon that we've ever faced, and public health may provide a template for how to deal with those uh, stigmatized populations. Um, and in fact, violent extremism may really be only one of many potential adverse outcomes from a familiar set of risk factors. Um, you know, such as marginalization, poor governments, access to services, family community support, undressed trauma, so on and so forth. Um, Steve, you've looked at rehabilitation programs all over the world from a public health perspective. Uh, can you help us put together some of what we've heard and some of the dynamics that we've talked about today? 
Thanks. I'm going to stand up. I think it will help all of us. Um, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Leanne, for um, pulling this important event together and for inviting me to contribute. Thanks to the panelists for sharing their insights and knowledge, and thanks to you in the audience for hanging in there and for your leadership um, on, on this issue. So I'm going to flash to Kazakhstan, a Central Asian country, former Soviet Republic, which, um, as far as I know, leads all countries in terms of having repatriated more than 400 children and 100 mothers, along with 30 adult uh, male former fighters. And the government of Kazakhstan has developed a national rehabilitation and reintegration program. Um, which has involved the government agencies and local NGOs to support its implementation. I traveled there in June and in November um, through support of the State Department, and I had opportunity there to uh, meet with, um, well, to, to visit three of the centers and to meet with uh, leadership and the professional staff from all 17 centers and to interview a number of women and children. To, to understand what's going on over there. And one of the things that I heard was a lot of concern about kids like, say, age 10 to 13. Um, why, why concern about them? Because they were old enough to have been involved in some kind of training um, with weapons or suicide vests. They, were, they had been indoctrinated into the ideology and perhaps instructed that, um, that when they go to their country, they shouldn't say anything. And so people wanted to know what, what kind of risk are, are these folks. Um, and I think Kazakhstan, uh, the, the folks I met who are working on this, fully recognize uh, these kinds of risks, but essentially are treating these kids and moms um, as, as if they're victims and trying to offer them kind of humanitarian support to facilitate their uh, rebuilding their lives in their home country. And in some sense, no country that I know is doing um, what Kazakhstan is doing in terms of having launched such an, an ambitious program. And, but no doubt they're grappling with many serious challenges there. And so I want to share a little insight on some of the challenges by giving you a few case vignettes. And in these vignettes, I have changed facts and so that nobody would be identifiable. So. One would be a tween returning, a 10-year-old boy who goes to school. Um, they all get put, placed into school. Um, and there he meets other kids. Um, and they like tell him what normal life looks like. Um, and you, know, you don't have to be forced to read the Quran every day. Um, and so he goes back and tells his mother, um, you know, why, why are you making me do these things? And she kind of backs off and, and in some ways, he, his life starts to look more like the peers in his school. I think this could be thought of as an example of family and community processes facilitating rehabilitation and reintegration. Um, I heard another story about a 19-year-old woman um, who followed her new husband to Syria, and there he was killed along with one of their children, and now she's back in her country with uh, her daughter. And both of them um, basically um, cry all day and ask, why can't we return to Allah and see our loved ones uh, again? She has PTSD and depression, and she's getting, I'd say, good support from the center, but isn't getting um, the kind of treatment that like Heidi would recommend in terms of trauma informed um, care. Um, she's also in a struggle with her family who worry over her and she says, treat me like a baby or treat me like a child and I don't want to be treated that way. So she's not living with them. I think this could be thought of as an example where some of the mental health processes and family processes can impede rehabilitation and reintegration. Uh, many women who returned from Syria uh, with their children, refused to work with the rehabilitation centers. And the staff said to me, they don't trust us. They come back with made-up stories and legends. Um, and a lot of these returnees are upset. They protest that the government prohibits 
um, their children from wearing hijabs in school. They refuse all medications and therapies. Um, they instead take cumin seed, and they say to these workers, how are you supposed to teach us if you are not a righteous person? Um, so I think this is, you know, an example of some of the complexities going on in communities and the relationship between communities and state agencies and how these processes, if not addressed, can impede um, rehabilitation and reintegration. So um, these are some of the things that um, USIP states that um, they believe in, and I certainly believe in them too, the important role of communities and the social dimension of the work that we're um, talking about today. I talk about the need for avenues to en enable social cohesion, for sustained, positive, inclusive, pro-social engagement, and then they talk about resilience, uh, community resilience, and the importance of that. Um, so I think that this raises a number of challenges. If you go to a place like Kazakhstan or any other such place th with these ideas in your head, um, you, you immediately, or I immediately find myself asking these kinds of questions. What role might community resilience play in rehabilitation and reintegration, and how does it interplay against um, other core rehabilitation and reintegration processes, such as we've heard of from the other speakers? How might community resilience be tailored for local sociocultural context? Because for sure, we know that uh, an idea that you know, we, come, we have in our heads or in our computers in Chicago or DC is not going to immediately translate into something um, in another country. It has to be filtered through um, local culture and practices, all that stuff. So through what levers can community resilience contribute to re rehabilitation reintegration? What are the contextual factors that facilitate or impede the possibilities for building community uh, resilience or social cohesion against violent extremism? And what are the indicators of community resilience? How can they be measured? These are the, some of the things that um, were on my mind when I was there and thinking about it afterwards. So when we think about community resilience and the factors that either build it or diminish it, um, we think about it from a socio-ecological model which um, is similar to like what Heidi presented earlier, which is fundamental to a public health point of view. So we again see the individual nested in family, in community, and in broader social societal context and organization. And so we want to think about risks and protective factors at each of those levels. So in order to um, think about this further, um, a few of us, uh, um, um, Heidi, myself, uh, Emma Cardelli, and Zach Brombat back there, um, decided to take a look at existing evidence and conduct a rapid review on this. So we're, our point of view is that um, there is a lot of evidence out there and that countries that are trying to implement a program of rehabilitation and reintegration should, as much as possible, leverage off of um, existing evidence. And so we turned to existing literature in clinical, community, and social science, which has examined children who are exposed to trauma and adversity. And I'm not talking about like the studies of disengagement and de-radicalization. I'm talking about um, other areas. So we thought about other kinds of um, experiences that are very close to this in some ways unique experience of returning from Syria and Iraq. Um, and so we thought about refugee children, war impacted children, um, former criminal gang members, child victims of domestic abuse, and trafficking uh, victims, each of which have important affinities with the kinds of trauma and adversity that these child returnees have experienced, kind of as Heidi was saying earlier. So we selected a we reviewed many articles, and then of those, we selected a total of 28 articles, of which 14 were reviews themselves. And then we tried to sort through them to under, look at, especially at the outcomes that these projects uh, were focused on, risk factors, protective factors, best practices, and we used that to try to build an intervention framework. And so this is the framework that we built from that. And 
what you can see is that it's composed of four levels. So if you looked at all of the evidence-based practices that have been used against in all of these experiences, they kind of sort into four levels. So promoting um, individual uh, mental health and health, uh, top level, promoting school success, promoting community and family support, and improving structural conditions and protecting public safety. Um, so right away, you can see that it's not all about individual level, right? We're talking about what was learned from the work with child soldiers, trafficking victims. All these other levels are important. You have to pay attention to that. So we need a multi-level approach, implying that policies and programs are needed at all of those levels. Um, then we looked down further, and we looked at the risk and protective factors of many hundreds that were identified across all of these different um, experiences. We sorted them into, in each of these different spaces, the individual space, the school space, the um, community and family space, and the public safety structural space, which risk and protective factors does it look like you, you'd really want to be able to um, uh, move? So um, we identified things like displacement stressors, alcohol, drug use, health problems, developmental, uh, this, sorry, it got scrambled. And by the way, I have a handout if you want it, and you could email me and I'll send you this whole thing. Um, um, access to services, um, or delays in access to services, excuse me. Um, other risks at the level of schools, um, learning problems, bullying, discrimination, language barriers. Um, at the level of, wow, that's really a mess. It wasn't on my computer, I don't know. Um, um, stigma, social isolation, detachment, poverty, unemployment, acculturation stressors, um, at the level of structural conditions, economic hardship, lack of education and employment, um, inequitable access to resources, um, those kinds of things. But the good news is that there's lots of protective factors, um, family support, belief system, hope and, opti hope and optimism, uh, at the school level, attendance and engagement in school, teacher support, peer um, friendships and support, recreational activities, and um, so at the social community level, social support, religious faith and support, family acceptance, cohesion, family um, responsibilities, outside mentors, em employment, financial stability, um, making the immigrant, the reentry repatriation process less strenuous, um, safe environment, positive engagement with the state, civic engagement. So there's a lot to work with. Um, um, this is a kind of a menu for the things that um, programs would want to look out for in terms of either amplifying those protective um, resources in each level or, um, or trying to de-amplify the um, risk factors. And so we, these are the big kind of takeaways of what is the policy agenda to promote programs. So at the level of individuals, provide mental health and health services to recover from developmental, mental, and physical injuries. At the school level, promote school involvement and success, especially for delayed distressed youth with specialized education programs. Then at the community and family level, strengthen community resilience and support to mitigate stigma and discrimination. Strengthen families and mitigate family conflict. And then at the structural level, improve the conditions for living and working for children and mothers and assess security threats and prevent future involvement in extremism and targeted violence. And then um, we thought about those things. And if you map those out, um, those really if you map those out in relation to what's described as the levers of community resilience, they map onto seven levels of community resilience. Wellness, access, education, partnership, engagement, equity, and safety. Um, and so, um, in a way, this model identifies how um, the work, uh, build, if you leverage off of existing evidence um, with all these different kinds of children exposed to trauma and adversity, it's telling you, you got to be building community resilience in these seven very specific ways um, if you want to be, uh, if you want support from the existing evidence. So um, what are the takeaways? The takeaways are that existing evidence 
from relevant areas of child trauma and adversity illustrates that there are multi-level factors and processes involved in the rehabilitation and reintegration of child returnees, and those especially include social processes, schools, things like that. Another takeaway is that communities can build resilience to violent extremism through activities that enhance the levers of wellness, access, education, partnership, engagement, equity, and safety. Um, and we also believe uh, in a public health approach that um, this should not be focused narrowly um, just on um, this issue that we've chosen, but on other threats that community members or community leadership identify as a problem in their community. Things have to be broad, not uh, so narrowly focused. Um, then, of course, addressing the multi-level factors and processes that we've just outlined can only be achieved through public-private partnership and copious civilian involvement with multidisciplinary collaboration. This is not a job just for security agencies. It's a job that has to be done with civil society, and it's not a job just for psychiatrists or psychologists. We need educators, community leaders, youth leaders, uh, religious folk, um, all of us uh, working together. So in many countries, efforts are needed to build the capacity of leadership and of practitioners in civil society and government, no problem. Um, and so some of the areas of need that we've identified are trauma-informed mental health care, developmental assessment and support. I mean, because like a lot of these kids have been exposed to malnutrition, head trauma, um, horrendous trauma and other kinds of medical illness, which is affect their physical development and neurological development. Um, also specialized educational programs. Um, it's not enough just to put these kids in um, any classroom. They've been out of school for a number of years. They require um, individualized educational plans they, and um, in order to help them to succeed and to be on that trajectory that Heidi was mentioning before. Um, violent extremism, risk assessment, and prevention. Um, this is something that we're challenged to do in any context, but it's something that, that has to be thought about then. How, how do we understand which of these kids or moms is at risk? Um, and, um, and that's an issue that's gonna have to be um, grappled with over um, many years, because if you think about how many years it will take for, say, a three-year-old to, to become a young adult when we would expect that they would be at most at risk. This is going to be, have to be a concern going forward 15, 20 years, I'm sorry to say. And then last but not least, um, training in building community and family support and resilience. Uh, because for all the reasons we've said, the evidence points us in that direction. We need to make investments in helping families and communities to know how to, to um, pro progress in those areas. Um, thanks much. If you email me, um, I could send you this uh, presentation. Thank you, Steve. Um, that was, I think, fascinating. Uh, I, I really appreciated the way that you nested individual family and community processes in, in kind of a, such a succinct way um, and really highlighted for us how extremely contextual this is. Um, you know, I, I may be a bit biased because I'm married to a public health professional, uh, but I really do think that public health and peace building have a lot to offer each other and our kindred spirits in some ways. Uh, and it's a partnership that I think we don't make often enough, um, but but I think it, it they have a lot to offer each other. Um, you know, it's interesting, violent radicalization doesn't occur in a vacuum, right? It occurs as the result of lived experience in a particular context. Um, and, and many people are going to be returning to that very same context. So without addressing the cognitive, social, and structural dynamics that we've been talking about all day um, to violent extremism, disengagement is really not going to be sustainable. Um, I am cognizant of the time. We have about 10 minutes left, and I don't want to monopolize it all uh, blabbering on my own. We probably have time for maybe one round of, of questions. I'll take maybe three or four of them at a time. Uh, and throw them all out to the panelists uh, all at once. Okay, I see a hand here in the front row. I see uh, a front hand here, Aaron Moore. Uh, all the way in the back, gentleman in the white shirt. Uh, and then right here, uh, black jacket. And we have microphones that are going to be coming around. 
Uh, hello, Catherine Legero. I'm with uh, Office of Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. I appreciate the fact that you guys did um, look into different sectors to sort of influence um, the the collection of, of, of research that you had. Um, but I'm interested to know in terms of some of these applications and sort of solutions being put forward are sort of like very system based and we sound very costly and very long term in approach. And so my question to you is how would you actually, I guess if there's one thing to in initially focus on, um, what would you put forward as an area of which uh, policymakers could be doing their due diligence to really tackle this um, this issue, especially as we're thinking through, uh, there's a shift in looking at how our government is engaging in these spaces, focusing now on competition as opposed to um, countering VEOs. And so what could the narrative be? What could potential um, initial steps be for policymakers? Thank you. And we're, we're going to take all the questions at once and then throw them out to the panelists. So the four uh, that I said in, in generating the uh, Helms tooth jacket. <laughs> Lynn Carter with MSI. Thank you all for those very interesting presentations. Mary Beth, when you were looking at the characteristics um, tied to recidivism, you pointed to retaining ties to the ideology. And of course, we're all dancing around de-radicalization and talking about disengagement and behavioral change that gets people to step away from violence. Yet, if the ideology is an important characteristic for going back to the group, I mean, can you elaborate? Thanks. And then a gentleman with the blue shirt and uh, charcoal jacket. Thank you. Uh, in the case of Iraq, we see that there are two ministries tasked with doing almost exactly what we're talking about. There's a vibrant NGO and UN community willing to do that. But we've seen that those ministries are quite explicitly disenfranchised from being able to make those calls. And it's the national security advisor who's calling all of the shots and is quite clearly intending to, when Iraq is in a better place to do so, repatriate their people into essentially a de facto detention camp. Um, although they, they reject that terminology. How do we get the importance of this message to security uh, and to help them see how a de facto detention facility is quite diametrically opposed to this approach? Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, the white shirt. Yeah, my name is Augustine. Um, my question is similar to the first question about government commitment. Um, I really appreciate the the, the talk concerning uh, how uh, the, how the people uh, perceive the government uh, approaches and policies towards it. So my question is, how do you reconcile you know a government that is uh, showing some kind of uh, you know laissez faire attitude towards uh, the programming of uh, of reintegration? You know the whole DDR process, you know, using Nigeria, for instance, the reason why it seems like, um, you know, these people are not so receptive is because the way the government, you know, postures itself on the DDR aspect of it, the public doesn't understand you know, exactly what is happening and the programs that have been laid out. So how do you run this whole program when, you know, to the eyes of the public and these affected communities, the government is not doing enough? So how do you carry it out? Thank you. And then one more question, uh, woman in a black jacket. Thank you. Rebecca Cataldi, International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. Um, my question sort of relates to the second one, um, but it was mainly directed to Dr. Smith. Um, if I recall correctly, you mentioned at one point in your presentation about um, in engaging someone that's a returnee um, to that it's more credible to have someone who shares their ideology but can speak to nonviolent ways of um, you know living it out. Um, but if the ideology itself is socially or psychologically problematic, like if it's racial or ethnic prejudice toward another group, um, could you speak to how to address that dynamic? And if it's if the approach is to address the issue of violence first and then ideology, at what point does addressing the ideology become appropriate? 
Thank you. Uh, so I think we have five questions. We have one about is there an initial investment that governments can make? Uh, we have a second question to Dr. Altier specifically about um, recidivism um, and if ideological ties are important to recidivism, recidivism, how do you reconcile that with the behavioral approach? Uh, we have a question about Iraq. Uh, Gender, specifically, uh, if people are returning to detention camps, how do you engage with security actors to uh, emphasize to them that, that this is really not a, probably a good approach? There's a question about how to reconcile governments with laissez-faire attitudes toward DDR and po populations who are maybe uh, not so thrilled to take people back. Uh, how, do you, how do you make that program more palatable to those governments and communities? And we have a question specifically for Dr. Smith. Um, about engaging those who share ideologies, uh, but when those ideologies may be problematic in some ways. I'm happy to jump in on maybe question one um, and a little bit before. So um, I'm a big believer in process. And I fully understand looking at the slides that both Steve put up and I put up, that's a lot that we're talking about. And it would be great if every country anyway was doing all of that. So how do we think about prioritization within that? Um, there's, a, there's a pressing need to get in there at the level of the individual child or family and understand what to do. But how you do that can be a process that builds some of those other protective factors. So for instance, in my slides, I was talking about the importance of trusting government and I was talking about trauma. When someone comes in to provide services, how you do that, the way you partner with the community, the way you think about the social ecology that is affecting the child's development and the way you take on those social factors as real parts of a child's mental health and functioning, you are communicating something about how agencies operate, how government operates um, and the service system that you're a part of. So what I would say is even if we're coming in to address the most immediate need of what do you do to help a child who is or, or a, an individual returning who is really struggling with trauma and mental health, the program and process around that can begin to lay the bricks for that larger sense of trust, cohesion and engagement throughout the broader community. Um, you mentioned the issue of cost. Um, what's the cost of not uh, investing in these things? Um, it's not as if uh, security solutions are are inexpensive. So uh, if I don't, you know, th having an honest conversation about that uh, would be important. But um, um, then I think that there are resources in most societies. There are capacities for um, addressing. Um, um, children impacted by trauma and adversity. I think you need a model. Um, I laid out one example of a model. Heidi laid out some elements of a model. Um, and there's no way that the model can't be a multi-level model. I'm sorry. Um, we can't just say, put our finger on one point and it's going to solve all these problems. We have to work with individuals, schools, communities, families, and in um, and, and greater societal structures. Um, but I think that we, what, what each country needs to do is form essentially um, a, a multidisciplinary body of experts um, in their space in education and mental health and criminal justice um, who could say, compared to this ideal model, this is where we're at, and we need um, strategic investments to build our capacity here, there, and other places. Um, um, as a mental health professional, I'm aware that uh, many of these countries don't have access to mental health services or child mental health services, and, and um, especially with with expertise and trauma, like Heidi is talking about, and so um, that does require some kind of strategic investment. But the good news is, if you make that investment, um, you could have a benefit. Uh, the evidence tells us that we can help these kids, and the, and that um, what I hope is that the numbers are not that huge. These these are not a, not huge numbers per country from a public health point of view to deal with 400 kids or something like that. My hope is that through working with those number of kids, you're building the expertise, building the relationships that can then leverage into um, broader gains in terms of 
preventing violent extremism in general or other public health or public mental health gains for kids and families. Thank you. And um, I know that we're running up against time here, and uh, that's my fault as moderator. I did not manage that very well. Um, if you guys have to run out, totally get it. Um, there is a, uh, a survey on your chairs. If you guys feel uh, compelled to fill that out for us, we would highly appreciate that. Um, otherwise, if you want to run out, that's fine. I'm going to ask Mary Beth and, um, and Laura if they have a, a, an answer to the question that was uh, directed directly to them. Yeah, sure. So in terms of the ideology, I do think we should be focused primarily on behaviors, even though it is an important risk factor for re-engagement. I think that giving people the space to disengage and while they're disengaging, as I mentioned, I think that that process of de-radicalization often happens organically um, as they start to establish other social bonds. We do need to be aware if they are ideologically committed. But I think some of the things that Heidi talked about and Stephen talked about are things that set that process into motion. Um, and, and prison, too, also gives people space, time away from the group, time to think. I've seen it time and again with individuals. So, um, And also just having credible messengers. I think some of the things Rebecca spoke to. So there are other credible voices in society that might help with that, that process. And I think my answer um, to my specific question directly leads from that um, about this credible messenger. Um, so what I was saying is not so much ideology as, um, as communications with people who share that worldview. And by worldview, I meant grievance. So if we, uh, if people are to be persuaded to choose nonviolent courses of action, then they need to hear it from somebody with, who shares their grievance and that they advocate for peaceful responses rather than the violent ones. Great. Thank you, everyone. Well, I think we, we threw a lot at you. I hope you got uh, enough, as much out of it as, as I certainly did. Uh, thank you for joining us.